Okay, units of measurement. This is a very expensive object lesson for the importance of units. So 1999, NASA lost its Mars Climate Orbiter. They launched this thing, $125 million spent on making this thing. And it's supposed to go up and orbit Mars and send us all this great information. So it gets up there and the computers are saying, um, it's not programmed quite right. We need to adjust its trajectory so that it doesn't you know, get too close and burn up or get too far away and just go off somewhere else. So the scientists made some adjustments and they type them into the computer and everything seems to be good except that it gets closer and closer and it does burn up in the atmosphere. So of course, you know, this was a big deal. What happened? They investigate, they find out, I forget exactly which way it was, but I think it was the computer was doing things with metric units and the engineers on the ground did their calculation in English units. And they put the numbers in without making sure the units matched up. And so then the trajectory is wrong, the whole thing burns up. Because they didn't pay attention to inches and centimeters. Units are very, very important. Now sometimes the stakes are higher than other times, but units are always very important. There are two common unit systems, the metric system and the English system. So the English system is things like feet and inches and degrees Fahrenheit, and that's what we commonly use in the United States. The metric system is based on powers of 10. Um, what scientists use is technically not exactly the metric system. It's the international system of units or the SI system. It's based on the metric system. As far as I'm concerned, the differences between the metric system and the SI system just do not matter at all. And so I'll use those terms interchangeably. These are the base units in the SI system. Um, these last two electric current and luminous intensity, we're not going to be dealing with those at all. But we've got meter as the unit of length, kilogram for mass, time, the base unit is a second, and temperature is a Kelvin. The amount of substance is measured in moles. And those are the SI? Those are the SI base units. And that's one of the very subtle differences between the metric system and the SI system is what's the base unit. In the metric system, the base unit of mass is the gram. In the SI system, it's the kilogram. Does it really matter? In Chem 1A, it matters not at all. So let's look at these base units. Um, it is very, very helpful to have an understanding, just a basic understanding of how large these things are. So a meter. You're probably not familiar with measuring things in meters. How big is a meter? Well, this is a meter stick. It's not a yardstick, it's a meter stick. If we look at the inches on the other side, it's about 39 and a half inches. A, a yard is 36 inches. But ballpark, are they the same length? Yeah, so a meter is about the same as a yard. So if, if you did a calculation and found out that this basketball player was seven meters tall, is that a reasonable answer? No. He could be seven feet tall, right? Seven meters would be 21 feet. Nobody's that tall, right? So if we, if we have a concept of how big the unit is, we can catch some of our mistakes by recognizing that's ridiculous. Okay? All of these units have very, very precise definitions. I'm not going to go over them, but they're listed there. The mass. The SI base unit is a kilogram. A kilogram is a little over two pounds, right? So, you know, if you weigh 100 pounds, um, in kilograms would be more like 50 kilograms. So that sounds a lot nicer, right? Same amount of you. Um, a unit that we use more commonly in chemistry is the gram, because a kilogram is big. You know, we're not gonna do experiments with one kilogram of stuff. Two pounds of chemical, wow, that would be really, really wasteful. So we use grams a lot in chemistry. So how big is a gram? Well, a gram is one one-thousandth of a kilogram. So one one-thousandth of a little over two pounds. That doesn't really do much. Um, this is a better way to think of it. Here's a nickel. A nickel is five cents. A nickel weighs about five grams. Just a ballpark idea of how big this is. 
there is a difference between mass and weight. Weight is actually a unit of force, or a, a, a force. Uh, it's the force of gravity on your body, if you're measuring the, the weight of a person. That's going to vary if you go, say, to the moon, where the gravi gravitational force is less. You will weigh less on the moon. Does that mean you're smaller? No. Your mass is the same. The amount of stuff in your body is the same. So as long as we stay on the planet, we can kind of use matter, I'm sorry, mass and weight interchangeably, but it's important to understand that there is a difference. It has to do with gravity. Second, uh, measure of time. We, we shouldn't have to really talk about that. Um, Kelvin is the SI unit for temperature. And um, again, I mentioned this earlier, temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules that compose the matter. Um, temperature tells us what direction will thermal energy transfer. Thermal energy will always flow from the warmer thing to the colder thing. And we know that intuitively. If you stick an ice cube in a glass of warm water, the water's going to get cold and the ice will warm up, right? It never goes the other way, where the water starts boiling and the ice gets colder. It just doesn't happen. So let's look at the, the Kelvin temperature scale. The Kelvin temperature scale is based on absolute zero. So here we have an illustration showing the Fahrenheit scale, the Celsius scale, and the Kelvin scale. And the most important difference between these is what are we calling zero? So on the Celsius scale, zero is the temperature at which water freezes. On the Fahrenheit scale, zero is somewhere below that temperature. It doesn't, zero on the Fahrenheit scale doesn't really have any significance. On the Kelvin scale, zero is assigned to the lowest theoretically possible temperature. That would be the temperature at which there is no temperature. There's no kinetic motion. Even the vibration of molecules stops. Okay, so there cannot be a negative temperature on the Kelvin scale. And that makes the Kelvin scale very useful um, in certain situations like using the gas laws. We have to use the Kelvin scale because otherwise we end up with zeros and negative numbers and when you try to divide by something that's zero, you get an undefined quantity. So zero on the Celsius scale is an arbitrary assignment. We assigned it to be the water, the temperature at which water freezes because it's convenient. And we assigned the temperature at which water boils to be 100 degrees because it's convenient. On the Fahrenheit scale, um, those temperatures are 32 and 212. Classic English unit, just <laughs> random numbers, right? What the heck? There, there's actually history behind it, um, but we're not going to go into that. So here, this is a metric unit because we're taking that difference and we're dividing it in tens, right? So there's 100 Celsius degrees, whereas there's 180 Fahrenheit degrees. On the Kelvin scale, the unit is Kelvin, not degree Kelvin. A Kelvin is the same size as a degree Celsius. The difference is where zero is. So between water freezing and boiling, there's 100 units. But they're labeled differently because here we have zero at absolute zero. And over here, zero is the temperature at which water freezes. So the difference there is 273. Which brings us to converting between these units. So these are equations that you should memorize. The conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit, the conversion between Kelvin and Celsius. We have to use equations for these. We're going to learn about dimensional analysis and how wonderful it is. We can't use dimensional analysis to convert temperatures because there's this addition part of it, because the zeros are not in the same place. If you take a length 
and you, you're going to do five centimeters, you're going to convert that into inches. It's just a matter of the unit size. Zero length is zero length in any unit, right? On the temperature scales, the zeros are in different places. So we have to use equations. So those are the equations. So let's do an example here. So gallium is a solid metal at room temperature, but will melt to a liquid in your hand. Now, is that a necessary part of the problem? No, that's like you know, background information. The melting point of gallium is 85.6 degrees Fahrenheit. What is this temperature on the Celsius scale and the Kelvin scale? So we're going to need two answers here. We need to convert Fahrenheit into Celsius and into Kelvin. So let's do the first part first. So converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. Well, we need the equation. The temperature in Celsius is equal to the temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32, the whole quantity divided by 1.8. So we take the Fahrenheit temperature and plug it in here, 85.6, subtract 32, divide by 1.8. So we get our calculators out. You need to learn how to communicate with your calculator. So you could use parentheses here, or what I like to do is I do 85.6 minus 32, and then I press the enter button so that it finishes the subtraction, and then I divide by 1.8. Because you don't want to end up with 85.6 minus 32 divided by 1.8. That's a different number. So my calculator is giving me 29.777 and it just keeps going with the sevens. That is the temperature in degrees Celsius. So I'll just slap the unit degrees Celsius on that. We will be talking about um, significant figures. Um, for temperatures, the best thing to do is to look at where does this number end, the original number. So this number had a, num had a digit in the tenths place. Right? So we're going to round our converted temperature to the same decimal place. So we're going to round this to the tenths place, and we're going to say this is 29.8 degrees Celsius. And that's the answer to part A. Any questions? Yeah. Can I ask about some things, or would you rather wait? Uh, I'd rather you wait, yeah. We can use the rules of sig figs on temperatures. Um, it's actually um, better to just round to the same place. And it, it's better because the temperature units are very similar. Celsius and Kelvin are exactly the same size. And the Fahrenheit is only a little bit smaller than, than the uh, Celsius. So it, it really doesn't matter that much. So now let's convert. 85.6 degrees Fahrenheit to Kelvin. So we don't have an equation that does that directly. Could you make an equation? Sure you could, but then that's another equation you have to memorize. So to do that one, what we have to do first is convert to Celsius and then take the Celsius temperature and convert to Kelvin. So Kelvin equals the Celsius temperature plus 273.15. Oops. Do, you, do you use the one that hasn't been rounded yet? Yes. So the question is about rounding. And we'll discuss this later, but I'll just you know, do this correctly. When you take a number like this that you've, you've calculated, and then you're going to use it in future calculations, you want to carry some extra digits. This is the properly rounded answer to part A. But when I take this and I do some more math on it, I want to use the unrounded number. So I'm going to take the 29.7 um, and I want to carry at least two extra digits. And so then I'm going to add the 273.15. So I've got the unrounded one in my calculator. I just add 273.15, 302. 0.927, and then the 7s just keep repeating. 
That would be Kelvin. So here again, I want to round to the same decimal place as the original temperature. The original temperature ended in the tenths place. I want to round this to the tenths place. So this would be 302.9 Kelvin. It's not degrees Kelvin, it's just capital K Kelvin. Any questions? Yes? I am not aware of an equation. I don't know an, of an equation that goes directly from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. You could make one. You could derive one by combining the two, but it doesn't seem to be worth the effort. And we don't do Fahrenheit to Kelvin very often. We, mo we do a lot of Celsius to Kelvin and Kelvin to Celsius. So talking about the um, metric system. The metric system uses prefixes to change the size of the unit. It's important to have units that are different sizes because if our only unit of length was an inch, and you were trying to measure the distance from uh, Fresno to San Francisco in inches. You know, it's ridiculous. You need a big unit because that's a big distance. So we need units of different sizes. In the English system, they're just like kind of random. They, they have historical background, but it ends up being a mess. You know, 5,280 feet in a mile? Where does that even come from, right? In the metric system, everything's based on powers of 10. And they use prefixes that mean the same thing for all the different kinds of units. So you learn the system, and then you can do anything. So if you are still not into the metric system, I hope that you'll give it another chance, because once you learn it, it's really, really easy. So the prefix multipliers are shown in table 1.2. And what these do is they change the size of the unit. So the example here is a kilometer. Kilo is a prefix that means 1,000 or 10 to the third. So 10 to the third is more like the scientific notation version of that number. So if you're, if you're weak on scientific notation, go to Appendix 1A in the textbook and review that. I'm not going to teach it. You can ask me questions outside of class. But I expect that you understand scientific notation. So 10 to the third is what kilo means. So if we have one kilometer, that is 1,000 meters or 10 to the third meters. Kilo, that little k, is an abbreviation for 1,000. So here's a whole bunch of them. We've got their names, the names of the prefixes. We've got their symbols. Capitalization matters here. Um, there are three that start with M, mega, milli, and micro. Um, capital M for mega, which makes a unit bigger. Lowercase m, small m for milli, makes a unit small. And then we needed another M, so we're using the Greek M, mu, for micro. So be aware of those. The multipliers expressed here uh, makes a kind of cool graphic there. Don't even look at those. There's just way too many zeros. Use these numbers, 10 to the something over here, okay? There's gonna be a memorization quiz. A bunch of these are on the list of things you need to memorize. Now, we can't always do everything that we should do or that we want to do. So I'm gonna show you the ones that are the most important. Okay, so centi is very important. Milli, micro, kilo, probably mega. And, and we use these things in everyday life. You talk about megabytes or megabucks or a gigabyte hard drive. What does giga mean? Giga means 10 to the ninth. It's 10 to the ninth bytes. Now they have terabytes, right? 10 to the 12th. That's a lot of bytes. So examples. This is to help us understand what these prefixes are doing. So how long is 4.5 megameters in meters? Well, 4.5 megameters. What does mega mean? 
Mega stands for 10 to the what? 10 to the 6. So I can take this 10 to the 6 and substitute it in for the mega. So this is equal to 4.5 10 to the 6 meters. Well, we can't just have those running together. We're multiplied. It's 4.5 times 10 to the 6 meters. And if we look at this number, 7.13 times 10 to the minus 9th liters, how many nanoliters is that? Well, what does nano mean? Nano means 10 to the negative 9. Nano is like 9, nano, nano. So 7.13 times 10 to the minus 9 liters, instead of the 10 to the minus 9, I'm going to write the shorthand for that nano. So that is equivalent to 7.13 nanoliters. So the prefixes allow us to resize the units so that our numbers are nice. We typically use a unit that's in the ballpark of the size of thing we're measuring. Any questions? Yeah. Is nano on the list of numbers? Yes. Nano's on the list. So we've talked a lot about units. There is another group of units called derived units. These are combinations of other units. So volume is an example. Speed is another one. So speed is a derived unit. Um, miles per hour. It's involving two different units. Miles measures length. Hours measures time. Volume is a derived unit. It's a measure of space. Right? So if you take a unit of length and cube it, you get a unit of volume. So if you draw a little cube and you want to know the volume of the cube, remember back to geometry class, the volume of that cube is equal to the length of it times the width of it times the height. Well, if the length is one centimeter, and the width is one centimeter, and the height is one centimeter. One times one times one is one. Centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. Centimeters, centimeters cubed. So centimeters cubed is a derived unit. It's derived from centimeters. It's a unit of volume. So you can take any unit of length, cube it, it becomes a unit of volume. We also have other units that are volume units. A milliliter, milli means 10 to the minus 3, so this is 10 to the minus 3 liters, and a liter. And we, those are things we commonly use for liquids. Could you have liters cubed? No. You can't take a volume and cube it. There aren't that many dimensions. I mean, even if you go into the fourth, fifth dimension, it, volume cubed would be nine dimensions. That's not going to work. But I see that. People do some really neat, tidy work, and they've got cubic milliliters. So here we have a big cube that's 10 centimeters on a side. So how many cubes are in that? big cube. Well, there's 10 on this side, and it's 10 tall, and it's 10 deep, right? So it's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So we could write that as 10 cubed centimeters cubed. Over here, we have the little cube. It's one centimeter on a side. So the volume of this guy is one cubic centimeter. One cubic centimeter, doctors call that a cc. Cubic centimeter, cc. And the other name for that is milliliter. A milliliter 
is just a different name for the same volume as a cubic centimeter. So if this big thing is 1,000 or 10 to the third cubic centimeters, then it's also true that that is 10 to the third milliliters, right? Because a cubic centimeter is the same thing as a milliliter. What does milli stand for? 10 to the minus 3, right? So that's 10 to the third times 10 to the minus 3 liters, and that works out to be 1 liter. So a liter is a volume that's 10 centimeters on a side. A cubic meter is a lot bigger. That's a picture of me sitting inside of a cubic meter. I had a chance to go to Norway and went to the Museum of Science and Technology. They had this really cool display and they had this box. Um, one side was open, I wasn't suffocating in there. Um, and you can just sit in it, right? This is like so cool. Um, here are some common units and their equivalents. When you're doing unit conversions, which we will be doing, I would encourage you to use this table. Okay, this really has almost everything you need on it. Um, and so you, you don't really need to be looking for a bunch of other things. So note this one. That one's a really easy one, right? It's one to one. Cubic centimeters and milliliters are the same thing. But it's often overlooked or forgotten. And so then you're trying to do unit conversions and you get stuck because you forget. Cubic centimeters the same as a milliliter. So you should memorize that one, and you should memorize this one. The relationship between inches and centimeters, an inch is 2.54 centimeters, exactly. The rest of these, most of them are going between the metric system and the English system. Don't waste your brain memorizing those. This one up here is liters, milliliters, cubic centimeters. That's just using metric system. We're going to learn how to use the metric system, and you don't even, so you can just figure that one out. Another derived unit is density. We should have heard about density before. You should memorize this one if you haven't already. Density is the mass divided by volume. The density of a thing is a physical property, and it doesn't change with the size of the object. So if I take this meter stick, I could measure its volume and its mass and calculate its density. If I saw it in half and look at one half of it, is the density different? The volume's different, the mass is different, but if I cut both, if I cut this in half, the mass is half as big and the volume is half as big, and so the change cancels out, the density of the wood is the same. That makes sense? Now density can change slightly with temperature. Does mass change with temperature? No. Volume can change with temperature. When you heat something, typically it gets slightly larger. That's why if the jar lid is stuck, you run it under hot water, heat up that metal, it'll expand a little bit, and you might be able to get the lid off. Here are um, densities of some common substances. The temperature is specified because at other temperatures, the density might be somewhat different. But we don't need to use the temperature in any calculations. You don't need to memorize any of these except for the one, and that's water. At four degrees Celsius, pure water at atmospheric pressure is, has a density of one. So unless we're being more specific about the water, you can use the density of water as one gram per milliliter or gram per cubic centimeter. The others here, you might need to refer to this table to do some homework problems. Don't waste your brain memorizing those, okay? I missed what you said about the water, So you should remember that water has a density of one. That's something I expect you to remember. It's not a coincidence either. It was set up that way. Intensive versus extensive properties, we're almost done here. An intensive property 
doesn't depend on how much stuff there is. So the density of this meter stick, if I cut it in half, I've changed the amount of substance, but the density stays the same. That's an intensive property. The color of it stays the same when I cut it in half, right? Color is an intensive property. Intensive properties can be used to identify substances because they don't depend on how much stuff there is. So intensive, think like intrinsic, right? Internal, it's a fundamental part of the substance. An extensive property does depend on how much there is. So the length, the volume, the mass, those would be extensive properties. So two pieces of wood, one might be bigger than the other. The volume, the, the mass is different. But if they're made out of the same substance, their densities are the same, the color is the same, the physical properties, uh, the chemical properties are the same. So intensive versus extensive.